Well, it looks like we have our work cut out for us. <laughs> <laughs> These are all great organizations and uh, challenging questions. All right, so why bother having a technology plan at all? The main idea is to align technology with the mission of your organization. I've been in, involved in organizations that simply would go out and buy technology and then try to figure out what they could do with it. And this is sort of putting the cart before the horse. Start with the mission. Why does your organization exist? What is its goal? Who do you want to serve? How are you serving them? And start from that and then see if technology can do the system. <clears throat> this will also give you a direction for future technology. Not only do you, will you have a better idea of where you are now, but you'll be able to see into the future a bit what direction your organization should go in, what kinds of resources you might want to consider for the future, what you might wish to retire at the present. This will also help you budget. Budget is always an issue. This is one of the biggest differences between the for-profit and non-profit community. Yeah. <laughs> Budget is always an issue for everybody. And as always, think strategically. The idea of the tech plan is to give you a clear vision of where your organization is going in the future and how technology can help get you there. So we're going to start with the notion of an assessment. Figure out what you currently have. Identify your uh, resources, um, inventory, your equipment, uh, diagram your network. Understand how systems are currently functioning. So I'm going to start with some basic uh, terminology uh, that may or may not be appropriate for your particular organization, but these are terms that folks should be comfortable with. So we'll just go through them probably quickly. And this is just a list of the terms. <coughs> uh, you know, it's, in this day and age, not every organization has a network closet. Uh, but most do. Some have entire rooms. Um, the picture on the right, which is kind of hard to see, is actually maps <coughs> of a network closet, which is in fact just a wall of a closet. And it has... Um, a variety of equipment stuck to the wall, and that's generally how they are. The one on the left is a much better organized, spacious. Uh, does this look familiar to most people? <coughs> so what is inside the closet? One of the first things is what's called the D-mark. It is that spot where the outside world <coughs> stops and your inside network begins. It's where the telephone uh, service provider or your internet service provider puts the device that connects to your internal network. And that's why it's called a demarcation point. It's good to know where that is. And if you ever have trouble with your ISP or your phone service provider, they're going to start by asking you to figure out where this is and see if things are connected. So when it comes to ISPs, you know that, um, let me see if I can use this button, yes. Um, probably most of you are using Comcast, that's just a wild guess, what do you, would you agree? Or CenturyLink. Mm -hmm. um, these are simply companies that provide a connection to the internet. The question that everybody always asks is what kind of bandwidth are you getting for the money that you're paying. Bandwidth is simply uh, the speed of delivery of your internet connection. It, if you think of it as a water hose, it's the size of the hose, the amount of water that can flood through it at any one time. You can go to uh, various websites and test the speed of your connection, but one thing you should know is these speed tests are wildly inaccurate. Um, if you simply look at one, or run one on a particular day, uh, it'll give you a reading that probably isn't terribly meaningful to you. But if you do it consistently, then you can start to see, with the same speed test uh, website, you can see uh, trends. So you could uh, be able to 
determined that at noon everything really bogs down, but by three o'clock things are faster again. So the speed tests are sort of relatively helpful, but not um, not all the time. All right, this is an interior shot of the uh, network closet, and you can see the patch panel. This is simply where. Um, the wiring that's in your office, if you have uh, ports in the wall, this is where they end up. This is the other end. And plugged into them are patch, pan are patch cables, these cables that run over to your network switch, which is sort of the uh, brains of your internal wiring connection. And <coughs> hopefully attached to that is a firewall. The idea is that from your internet service provider, your connection goes into your firewall, which manages both incoming and outgoing activity uh, and can put certain controls on what is allowable in and what is allowable from uh, to go out. Am I going too fast? Is this okay? All right. Does anyone know why you should be in a position to monitor what's going out of your organization? Yes, it's how I determined there was a virus on one of the computers. Exactly right. Exactly right. It's the easiest way to determine that you have an infestation. It's because suddenly your uh, the workstation can turn into, a, become a member of a botnet and start sending spam or something out. So if you suddenly see a great deal of activity from a, a workstation shooting out of your organization, it's an indication that you probably have an infected workstation. Or luckily in our case, seeing a lot of cases where these connections are blocked. Yes, one would hope. <laughs> one would hope, but anyway. Awkward. Everybody okay? Mm -hmm. If you're looking to purchase cables, people always talk about Cat5. That's simply a kind of cable. Cat5 is computer cable. Cat3 is telephone cable. They're just different qualities of different, different yeah, qualities of cable. Um, the new best kind of cable is called Cat6, but Few people use it because it's terribly expensive. But it is better, and if you're looking for great speed, it's the way to go. You buy it from mono price, it's not much more than Cat 5 e But if you have to rewire your building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what we'd have to do sadly. Maybe we'll move instead. <laughs> On all of your major important devices, uh, your servers, uh, the modem that connects uh, your system to the outside world, uh, whatever. You want to have an uninterruptible power supply on it. And all that simply means is uh, if the power, if there's a disruption to the power, uh, that system will continue to function for a certain amount of time. It depends, the amount of time depends on the quality of the UPS you get. Um, but since most power outages, short of disasters, are on the order of 10 minutes or so, uh, almost any of these is okay. But if you find, if your particular building or location is wildly uh, uncontrollable in terms of electricity, you might want to look at a much more robust system, or even a generator if need be. So I assume you all know what a workstation is. That's, there's no surprise here. Um, these are two pictures of servers, just because servers come in different configurations. This is often referred to as a pizza box because you can have stacks of them uh, and they look more like a pizza box than a, a workstation. But this is also a server. Can anyone give me a quick definition of what a server is? Oh. Uh, it's, it's a computer <laughs> um, whose purpose is to provide a service. Uh, on your network, and the service can be almost anything. It could be file sharing, it could be printing, it could be access control, uh, it could be giving you access to a, a database, all, all sorts of different things. There are hundreds of, probably thousands of different things a server might do. But from a hardware point of view, the only really significant difference between a server and a workstation is it's more robust uh, hardware. It's designed to be on 24 hours a day, 
365 days of the year. Um, whereas the workstation we turn on and off probably don't really care too much about. So much more robust hardware and it's designed to provide services that's shared on your network. And why would people want a networked printer as opposed to a local printer? So people can share the resources. Exactly, in a the, in the controlled manner. Um, network printers tend to be less expensive per page than local printers. Um, that's changing a little bit, but for the most part, network printers are more, much more cost effective. But also, they're designed to be shared, uh, whereas local printers aren't. And any time that you set up a local printer to share it with some other colleagues, you're actually opening doors that can lead to security issues that you might regret in the future. So network printing is the way to go. All right, now slightly bigger picture. Different kinds of uh, network terminology. <coughs> you probably have heard of peer-to-peer, -peer, though I certainly hope that you haven't seen it. <laughs> uh, it's when I first started uh, working in uh, computing, it was a very common standard thing. That's what this area is down here. You have a simple hub that allows you to sh share network resources with each other. Um, but it is inherently uh, chatty. Um, uh, it's resource intense, it um, is messy, and uh, it's not secure at all. So that has been replaced, what, 20 years ago, by a different kind of structure that where your network is really run by a server or a multitude of servers that control, or I should really say switches that um, control the nature of conversation that's going on on your network. And all information, all streams go through one or more servers. This is the, the classic way of doing things, and the entire network would then be guarded by a firewall, and things would be safe and secure. And that's not how any network is anymore, either. In a small office, it's likely that you have a setup more like this, where you have, again, a modem or, or some sort of a connection from your ISP that, in today's world, may have built-in wireless with it. And this gives your office, particularly a small office, the ability to connect computers either using wire or wirelessly. How many people use this? Do you recognize this device right here? Is a Linksys uh, WRP? WRP. Mm -hmm. um, if you have one of these in your office, I would really urge you to consider replacing it by something else. This is the most popularly hacked device on the planet <laughs> <laughs> because they are so common. <laughs> but but the structure of the network is is uh, perfectly fine if if it's set up appropriately. And this design down here is designed to give you a sense of what a virtual private network is, which is simply a connection of, a, a secure connection of separate networks. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine uh, the main office being here, uh, a branch office here, maybe somebody at home, uh, but you're not, you're not, go you're not going directly, you're not communicating directly over the uh, internet, over the public internet. There, uh, uh, there's a use of uh, protocols and software that makes it much more secure and, um, and, and better. <coughs> and potentially a, per, uh, a permanent connection. Hold on, can, I'm sorry. I, I'm not really, I mean, I've heard of the cloud before. I have no idea what that means. Really, I mean, I, I mean, I, I conceptually I get it, right? So I'm not that dense, but my my question is, with a, you said it's it's more secure. I did not say that the cloud is more secure. Okay, I so said a virtual private network is more secure. Okay, the all the cloud is is the internet, and I mean the public internet, the thing that we all use, yeah. um, which is terrific and it's everywhere. The internet, it really is simply a wide area network. It is a network of networks. 
that are both private and public and all over the place. Which leads to a great deal of freedom, but also a great deal of risk. So if you're in a situation where, for example, you do have a branch office and you want the two offices to communicate consistently, for example, you're, everyone is perpetually consulting the same database or something like that, um, you would want a more secure connection than simply using the public internet. Um, the same, well. So are you talking like a Dropbox? Oh, let's hold off on Dropbox. Hold off, because I really, yeah. Because you really like more. Dropbox? Well, I use it a lot, and so if you have an opinion on it, I don't care. Um, I use Dropbox myself, mm -hmm. but I don't put anything in it that I particularly care about. Really? Um, I put mostly photos and some documents. Mm -hmm. Mostly photos. It's a good place to store things so like that. So it's not secure? It is not secure. Mm -hmm. uh, I would never put financial documents in it, HR documents, um, anything that that you have real serious security concerns about, I would not put in Dropbox unless I encrypted them beforehand. A Dropbox, it, it's widely known that Dropbox is accessible to those people who want to get into it. Um, but again, if you add a, another layer of security, for example, um, uh, a product called TrueCrypt that will allow you to encrypt things, I'm much more comfortable with that. So what do you think? Yeah. I, I think you're right. I, hmm. the, the only thing that I use Dropbox for is to store some pictures online that I'm sure of other people. That's it. Yeah. And I have lots of personal information stored there, but it is encrypted. Uh -huh. yeah. So for a small organization, that's all we use. I mean, we don't have a server. We don't have, you know. I, I just helped an organization uh, actually, I, I worked and with we're one. Back, which makes it interesting. Yeah, uh, I worked with an organization that um, was already using Dropbox, and I helped them put more things uh, into the cloud. And, and in part because they work from home, they work in the office, they work all over the place, and they want to be able to occasionally share uh, some information with with outside people as well. Mm -hmm. So Dropbox is good at that. Mm -hmm. But I de then taught them how to use uh, TrueCrypt and uh, made sure that they did not put their financial information in Dropbox at all. Uh, but they have a secondary system for, for Our financial information isn't in it at all, because we use QuickBooks online. So I'm not sure what I worry about. getting into, but... Well, hmm. the, 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 biggest, the bi biggest security concerns when it comes to your data are uh, things like social security numbers, so HR records, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. medical documentation. Um, and um, and then your financial information. Sure. What I, I know a bunch of people use uh, either Google Drive or or uh, or uh, SkyDrive by Microsoft. They're both uh, fairly well secure. There's a lot of storage that you have for that is relatively inexpensive and, 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 and that you can share with other people. So. The, uh, you've probably been hearing stories recently about the NSA and other uh, organizations and what they can and cannot do. Um, it seems to be that they can do whatever they want to do. And if they wish to get into your data, they will be able to get into your data. Um, but there are other people out there who are also trying to get into your data, and they don't have quite the skill set or, or the tool set that the NSA has. But reasonable prudence is always a good idea. And this, um, my favorite security guru, um, Bruce Schneier, says that um, encryption is still the way to go. But to not use any commercial product, because it turns out that our government has been building relationships with all developers of commercial products. But there are open source products that are really good, like TrueCrypt um, and um, other things, some of which will come up here. And they, they can add an additional layer of security for you. So this is my last image on uh, networking, and it is my attempt to describe the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, 
And really, again, this is simply the space of the internet where you find all the stuff that you normally do, whether you're surfing the web using uh, Chrome or Internet Explorer or whatever. Uh, some of these things are um, uh, databases. Salesforce is a database. Um, uh, QuickBooks Online is a database. Um, then some are storage, Dropbox and Flickr are storage areas. Uh, you, you can do online shopping. Of course, there's email with Gmail and Office 365. Um, and there are lots of other things that can, uh, services and, uh, and such that are available in the cloud. But in addition, you can go through the cloud to other resources that may be private. For example, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to figure out how to add lines to my cloud. <laughs> um, your laptop can connect to the cloud and then possibly get into some resources that you have here in the office that aren't publicly available, or using your smartphone to, to do the same thing, or possibly uh, going from your home computer to talk to a friend, uh, a product, all these different ways of connecting to uh, resources uh, that are either public or private. Does that help at all? Is that, is that making sense? Mm -hmm. I'll just add uh, one. Mm -hmm. um, when you talk about the cloud computing, like, okay, we're uh, server based, and we go into the cloud, um, we still need stuff from our server, so we just have to contract services into the, I mean, it's still kind of the same concept of, but I don't have to pay for the server and the hardware, because I could just pay somebody else to maintain the server and keep information on there. I kind of, I would just, my question becomes, uh, what, where would be a good play? Um, any suggestions on where to, when we go into the future, um, if we're moving away from server, or what? Mm -hmm. It depends on what the server is doing. Remember, server simply provides services. So you have to, you would start by figuring out what kinds of services you're interested in, which might be file sharing, and something like Dropbox exists for that, and so does Box and SkyDrive and, and uh, these other things. So you have options. And there are many additional options as well. Or possibly it's an email server, in which case you, the two obvious solutions are Office 365 and Gmail. Um, you can do document uh, design and uh, uh, creation and modification in the cloud, also using you know, Google Apps, for example. The, nice thing about that, there are several nice things about it. Uh, one is, like you say, you don't have to deal with maintaining the server, purchasing the equipment, dealing with any of those headaches. That is a major benefit, huge benefit, especially when it comes for something like email. Um, there is, there is, oh, and it's, uh, the costs become really quite specific. You know it's, you know, five dollars uh, per person per year or whatever it is. It's predictable and easy to put into a budget. Uh, and in the case for nonprofits, many of these things are completely free, which is, you know, rather appealing. Um, potential downside, if the internet goes down or your connection to the internet goes down, you might lose uh, your ability to get to that information, whatever it is. Uh, there was an outage just yesterday of Office 365. Did anyone experience that? Fortunately, it didn't last very long. And that's an inherent risk, and that does not mean that uh, Office 365 or any other thing um, is uh, less reliable. These things do happen. Amazon was out for a while, um, a couple months ago. Did I answer your question? Yes, I was just uh, I should say the, the other potential risk with uh, working in the cloud is, of course, security. It's always more secure if whatever it is you're concerned about is in the same room with you and no one else gets access to it, you know, whether that is a physical document or a file on your computer. If so, the further away it is from you, the more other people have opportunities to get to it. That may or may not be a concern. It depends on on what it is, if a, you know, it may be a public document in the first place, so that's all right. Or it might be your, your website, for example. The whole point is to promote that sort of thing. But if it is something that you are deeply concerned about, it's your, you know, um, 
intellectual property that your organization depends on, um, then you might want to think twice about that or add some additional controls. Are we doing okay? All right, so much for the hardware. Let's just briefly talk about a couple services. These are things that you would want to be able to discuss uh, if you're in a, if you have any issues. If something comes up, someone's going to ask you these questions. It would be good, helpful if you have the answers. One is who is your internet service provider? You should know who that is or what the company is and have their service phone number handy. You're the same for the telephone service. Um, your domain name registrar uh, is the, your um, organization's website name, mapfornonprofits.org, for example. Uh, it's good to know where that is registered and how long it's registered for, because you don't want it to ever expire on you. Um, it's good to manage. Did you have a story to tell? Oh, yeah, as a new startup, we've gone through GoDaddy, and it's been interesting to kind of continuously get these, you need to re-up, you need to re-up, because I have my own independent consulting company that I've gone through GoDaddy with, too, so now I've got two different customer numbers, and they're sending me stuff all the time, so after a while, I'm just kind of like, I don't want to think about it anymore, but then knowing that I got, uh, I went to my own website, and I thought, uh, why is it not functioning any longer? So... Yeah. Uh, something else you might want to do with uh, your domain uh, registration, if there is a, a similar name, if people consistently uh, call you something else, yep. uh, you might want to register that name as well. <coughs> or um, in addition to mapfornonprofits.org, you might want to register mapfornonprofits.com, just simple dot ways net. of, or dot yeah. net, to, to really control that brand element. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, so the kind of the, the after the dot, right? So dot com, dot net, dot org. But uh, what I'm seeing now is more dot US, dot something else. I mean, what's the kind of the trend moving forward to? Uh, the trend moving forward is hundreds of mm -hmm. additional, um, whatever those things are. Domains. Domains. Domain names. Domain names. Domain names. Um, yeah, so dot local, uh, dot biz, mm -hmm. dot, yeah. uh, it goes on and on and on. Uh, the international organization that controls how domain names are structured recently allowed a huge additional yeah. number of domain names. Whether that's a, oh, for, and XXX I think is for um, sexually explicit sites, for example. Um, uh, NGO, that, that's good. Yeah, NGO, what? And NGO have just been kind of officially approved. So NGO and what? An ONG. ONG. Which is like in Spanish, it would be ONG. Thank you. Or French. Or French. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so if if you're an inter if you work internationally, that could be really compelling. Um, if you're a, you know if you work only in the Twin Cities, this is probably not something that you wish to pursue. But in any case, you might want to just consider what names you have registered and possibly consider registering a few more, especially since the cost is really quite minimal. Then uh, another thing is the DNS host, which probably came from your ISP, but you should know whether or not it does. This is what allows your um, uh, IP address to be associated with your name. It's how computers find other computers. Um, so it's just good to know how that's happening in, in the case of your organization. You should certainly know who your website host is. Um, and then if you have recurring software subscriptions, uh, put them on your calendar, <laughs> control them, renew them before they expire. Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, going back to the domain name, does that have something to do with the SSL as well? Because that has like a different expiration date than that. That that is a, yeah. That's a that's a different thing. Although that's a, a, also a very important element. If you're doing uh, online commerce, for example, or you have uh, some remote access uh, setups, that's simply adding an additional security level by forcing the 
connection that you're talking about, whatever it is, to rely upon a, what's called a security certificate that probably has been, I'm just going to say physically, but it's always electronically, <laughs> um, handed from whoever creates it to, um, to you or your computer or your uh, organization's computers. And initially, 10, 20 years ago, this was a really terrific way of controlling security. But as this whole idea has spread out, more and more organizations are creating certificates. And they are um, outsourcing their own certificate production to other companies throughout the world. And it's impossible now to know for a fact that a particular certificate is genuine. Uh, and this is going to be this is going to affect us all in, I think, in the next few months. There was a, all Google security certificates in Iran last year were proven to be counterfeit. And that's how the government was able to control access to Gmail accounts, for example. Because they all, threw, they all went through Iran's uh, assessment service. I'm losing my ability to speak. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The, um, the certificate authority of Iran created those certificates and they weren't legitimate, but they were totally controlled. Uh, so, and that's just one example of many, many counterfeit uh, certificates that have happened in the last uh, year or two. So, this is going to affect online purchasing and all sorts of other things. Sorry. I don't know that I helped you with that question. No, I think I, think I know the difference uh, now, maybe. Because I remember when I was expired, and you go, you go to our website to a different computer or something, and then it would be like, oh, are you sure you want to open this website up? It could not, it ah. could not be legit, basically. Right. Um, yes. Um, I don't have a slide of, of uh, that that warning that the there's an issue with the, certi with the security certificate. And that issue could be that it's expired. It could be that it's been misconfigured and only works for a couple pages of your website and not other pages of your website. And it could also be that it's fake. Um, so when you see that warning, you should stop and think before you do anything. Uh, and if you know for a fact what's going on, then feel free to say click yes and move forward. If you know that it's not an issue or that it's simply expired and you're going to fix it. But if you're out and about surfing the web and you stumble across that warning, really stop and don't go forward. And this is something that we also are going to have to be conscious of for our sites. Yes. Which is that if somebody is new to our site and doesn't know the organization and for some reason our tech isn't up to date and our certificate isn't up to date, when they get that warning, that's going to be, they're going to say, well, maybe I won't check out your number. Right, exactly. Yeah. But, 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 uh, a sort of brochure site or an informational site uh, will not, you probably won't use a certificate, a security certificate, yeah. um, because you're not concerned, unless that site also includes, you know, backend access for your staff to get into right. local resources, for example, yeah. or if you sell things online, right. mm -hmm. then you would have a certificate, and then that would be an issue. Yeah. That's something worth adding to this. All right. Ba uh, we will get to more interesting things here quickly. Uh, basic workstation stuff. Uh, probably Microsoft Office or some equivalent thing. And nowadays, possibly also uh, Google Apps for nonprofits. You should have some sort of anti malware solution. Um, in this day and age, I just have to take a moment to suggest to everybody that you get a password vault. Everyone has more passwords than they can manage. Yes. Um, so a password vault is just a secure database that manages your passwords for you. All you need is a really good one, really good password that allows you to get into it and to use it. Um, I added the asterisk here because now, as of this week, you really want to use an open source password vault rather than a commercial password vault because of 
what we now know the government has been up to. Um, an open source password vault is more secure. All there is to it. Um, and I only name two, there are many. <coughs> uh, when I name specific software, those are just examples. There are others that, that can be quite good. I have a question on the open source. This is a discussion me and my IT person has been having. Mm -hmm. He says, okay, we need a password vault. And he says, um, <coughs> let's use an open source. And he said, yeah, we can use an open source, but the problem is you don't know what kind of coding is running on the back end. That's exactly not true. Okay. The <laughs> point of open source is that you do know the coding. Okay. And the risk of a commercial product is that you do not know, know the, the coding. coding. Right. All right. All right. Okay. You know the difference. Like, what's keeper? Um, uh, the source. Where where does the software actually come from? Is it coming from a major corporation, or is it coming out of a university <coughs> or some open source um, organization? Source. Source. Do you know where that? You know where a, they are coming from? Okay. You you can you can generally tell. Yes. They don't, they don't say, they don't say, say on the page. This is an open source product. Oh. But, but the point of it is, is you can download the code for the application and change it. And right. change it. Look at it. If you if you want, to. <laughs> you, pro you probably don't want to, but, no, but, but that is a possibility. And, and the, the website sourceforge.org is a fantastic source of open source software. And, and if you go there, you know, if somebody has put something in the code that is malicious, there will be hundreds of people that will point that out. Okay. Can you say that website name? Sourceforge. S O U R. Sorry. I think it's source isn't it? Oh, is it .net? Sorry. Um, but we'll include that in a follow-up email. People can just put in their search browser, whatever they're thinking about open source, you know, uh, uh, write password vault, and then they'll come up with a whole list. Of, and all the major ones have reviews, and you can just look at the reviews and choose yourself. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. So there's uh, nothing else on this list is particularly uh, surprising, I don't think. These are just standard things that a, a workstation might have. Uh, these are some basic elements that a network should have, starting with a backup solution. You really need to back up your data one way or another. You might have an in-house backup system such as a backup exec or something like that where your files are being backed up onto a, a different server or a, a disk or something like that. You might be using a cloud-based solution, something like CrashPlan or Mozy Pro or Carbonite or something like that. Uh, but whatever, please make sure that somewhere on the planet there is a second copy of your most important data. Can you just mention some, sure. some, some, some about backing up your data, data uh, especially data that's data in the cloud? You should know approximately where your 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 backups are going. Uh, you know, since 9-11 was, was very close, in my mind, there were a number of organizations who had really solid backup plans and they backed up their sure. data, but they were in buildings adjacent to the ones that came down, and so those buildings weren't, weren't accessible. So not, so none of their backup data was accessible at the same time. This is a really important point. Yeah. It is ideal to have a backup in a geographically different location. And that's just because of 9-11. Think of uh, Hurricane Katrina or um, the one on the East Coast, Sandy. Sandy. So many organizations have their entire uh, network infrastructure in the basement. Sure. And of course it was flooded and that was the end of it. And they did have backup solutions, but they were all flooded out too. This is one of the most compelling reasons to have an in the cloud uh, backup solution. Uh, in, an in, in the cloud or in what's called a co-location. Some other physical location, but far away from where your organization is. And if you want it far enough away so that you know, a tornado or anything, an earthquake, anything big, major, um, doesn't affect both your organization and the backup. Yes, now we do have something like that in place. And I know after Hurricane Sandy, I was talking to a tech at a tech show from that company, and he said at that point they were running 200 companies off of their cloud backup system 
that it had their facilities destroyed by sand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, you think of these things as this is never going to happen to us, but these things do happen. And although we're like, unlikely to have a hurricane, we are likely to have some sort of physical disaster that that we don't want to think about. But think about it. Anyway. Um, don't just have an anti-malware solution on your computer. Try to have one that manages your entire network and that you can sit down and look at the console and see the state of all the devices on your network. Just, it's nice, makes life easier. It's much more important for a large organization than a three person organization. You should have, uh, you should have a firewall be, that guards between you and the outside world. Uh, it should be a next generation firewall and that simply means that it doesn't just look at the uh, IP address uh, of the sender and recipient, it doesn't just uh, look at the most basic level of, of the data. It looks at the application level. It looks at many different levels of, of the electronic exchange between... Deep packet inspection. Exactly, thank you. Deep packet inspection. I mention Untangle because it's open source, it's free, and it's fantastic. But there are uh, lots and lots of uh, firewall solutions. I just like to make sure that everyone knows that there are free, really good <laughs> solutions available. Nobody should be without a firewall. Your, I, I assume that everyone has a wireless uh, network in their office. It should not be open to the public and it should not connect directly to your most important data, uh, whatever that is. You want to be able to segment things and you want to be using strong encryption there are children who are running around with laptops looking to crack wireless networks. <laughs> you, you really, it's, it's fairly easy to protect yourself, but you must think to protect yourself. And um, update the, the software and hardware on your wireless networks. You want to have some network monitoring tools. Uh, this thing, Landsweeper, and also Spiceworks, these are free, open, not Spiceworks is an open source, but free solutions that will do an automatic inventory of all the hardware on your network. You don't have to run around and flip over the laptop of everything you've got. You can let this thing run for a day and you get a complete list of everything that's on your network. Why do you care what's on your network? How do you know if there's something bad on your network if you don't know what's on your network? Okay. So it's easy to do. Network monitoring. Use something to just see what's going on. If there's a wild spike of activity and no one is paying any attention, uh, you might be missing out on somebody stealing all your data. Uh, and everybody should have, I hate to say it, a syslog server. All this is, is a little device or a system. It can be installed on your workstation. It's something that you want running all the time. And what it does is collect logs of your major systems of your firewall, your servers, whatever you think is important to you. Collect it, collect it for all eternity. And this is because most people learn that they've been hacked months after the event, and they learn from somebody else who shows up at, at your door and says, you were hacked and you've exposed all my data. And if you don't have the logs, you won't have any recourse to what's going on or what happened or understand how to prevent it in the future. You will be, um, you'll be clueless. Have a syslog server running and you or a professional can figure it out and this can save your reputation. All right, we doing okay? I'm sorry. We'll try to pick up this, the pace here. Um, to maintain the status quo, just for everyday stuff, make sure that your systems are updated consistently. The operating systems and the software that are, the, that's the application software. I, I put th three things down here that will help you with the application software. Secunia's personal software inspector is great. This is free, but it's free for personal use. I use it on my personal computer, but Secunia who just recently opened an office in Minneapolis, uh, has 
offered a small business version, which is free to nonprofits. Um, install it on all your workstations. It will tell you if some application needs to be updated. You know, the most common way that uh, malicious folks get into your systems isn't through the operating system and isn't through uh, the firewall. It's through your applications. It's through things like Acrobat Reader and your uh, web browser and uh, simple things like that. That's why you really need to keep them up to date. When, when you see the little notice that there's an update available, sometimes that means that they're going to add some feature, but most often what they're saying is, we've discovered a security issue and we want to patch that issue. Install these updates. Sure. Java updates. Like yeah, if at all that. possible, remove Java. Yeah. But but the but FBI you can't always remove. The virus has gotten through on two computers. Yeah. And they snap pictures of you, and your computer freezes for forty-eight hours, and they want three hundred dollars. And it's a pain to get. If you ever encounter that, the notice, you know, we've hacked your computer, or we've determined that your computer has been hacked and for $99 or whatever it is, we will fix it for you. Stop, yeah. mm -hmm. turn the computer off, <laughs> and get a professional to come in and clean your computer. That is the moment of being hacked, mm -hmm. right? It's that when you click to get their assistance, that is not assistance you're getting. We had an issue where we uncovered accidentally that every time we update our um, staff personnel and their respective titles, it immediately Another database, an external database, basically, you know, these mm -hmm. databases which collects information, you know, of employees and all of that, also automatically updates. So we were wondering, uh, how was that possible? I would say... Uh, it depends on what, on, on what you're using, because it might automatically send that information. Yes, yeah, so yeah. people anyway. I mean, it was like it, for you to enter that info, uh, for you to access that, uh, they're like you can search any person in that particular database, you right. know, about employees. So um, when I was researching it, it says uh, if you want to join this database, you have to download the plugin. So I suspect that somebody in the organization uh, must have yeah, downloaded yeah, the yeah. plugin. Yeah. Yes, the so plugin was, was hacked. Okay, all right. So we blocked that website now when we uncovered it. Yeah. That's a good thing to do. <coughs> yeah. But I think what I was, my question is, how can we be more proactive? Is, is this where it's coming from then? The, um, uh, possibly. Um, you know, there are many, many different approaches to, to hacking. And the most sophisticated ones, we don't have tools to determine, frankly. Okay. Uh, the cleverest ones are ones that nobody notices. Bruce Schneier was saying the other day, what he does is he has a computer that never connects to the internet. It's just separate, and he never goes online. That's the only way he knows that it's safe. But, you know, how many people can be in a position to have a second computer that, you know, it's difficult. The, the other thing is if, is if you have either the syslogs or a really good firewall, you, it'll, it'll tell you where all your traffic is coming from and where it's going, and then you can diagnose those things. So if, if, for example, you notice yeah. that uh, there's a connection between a computer in your organization and um, a server in China, when you're not doing business with China or anything like that, uh, then that's sort of a red flag that there's an issue. Um, or an employee is having their work done. Or an employee yeah. is having their work done. Yes. It is also possible that somebody is stealing your data. <laughs> that story about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's another reason why it's important to have layers of security and layers of systems in place, because anyone can fail. Yeah. Thank you. All right, um, technology support. Now we're moving, we're moving from the nitty gritty to bigger systems. Who you really need, everybody needs to have someone they can call if there's an issue. It's something that you you just don't know what's happening, or you have an idea that something really catastrophic is happening. Now, you can certainly go on uh, the Tech Talk and ask a question, but if you know there are flames coming out of your server, you don't want to wait three days to, to get a potential answer. So it is very good to connect with somebody who really does, who is 
an actual trained professional. Maybe you only talk to this person once a year or once every five years, but have somebody who you know and trust and who is actually good, uh, who you can turn to in, in case there's a, there's a problem. This person might be a consultant, might work for a major corporation, might be a board member. You know, have somebody, somebody you know. Train your staff. Your staff don't necessarily need, uh, don't necessarily know how to do everything. They may be fantastic at Excel, but clueless at um, mail merges. But part of the job means they have to know how to do a mail merge. Teach them how to do that. Um, and just, a, this is, I'm sorry that this is a note at the bottom. Have technology policies and procedures, because I would I could spend the rest of the day talking about this. The idea of having policies and procedures is that you, as an organization, clearly spell out what is appropriate and inappropriate in your organization when it comes to the use of technology. And this includes things like no online gambling, you know that sort of stuff, the bad things, but more basic things like. Who has the right to install software on a workstation? You know, is it everybody, or do you want to have a, a list of software that's a, that you think is mission critical and other things can't be installed? You, you need to make it clear how things can work. Can employees do personal activities on the organization's computer? Can, the, can people work from home and remotely connect to your organization? All these things, they're not meant to be secret and not meant to be punitive. It's meant to clarify what you, you as an organization consider appropriate use and not appropriate use. Just quickly, so does MAP have like templates for that type of policies and procedures? Like, you no. know, a new organization, I'm not thinking about that. That's not my primary focus. Right. But I know it, how important it is, right? So my head doesn't go to, oh, well, stop people from doing this and stop people from doing that. My head is more about how do we, get the, how do we maximize the work that we do, how do we get more money to right. do what we do, and how do we continue on our mission. So, like, that, the technical detail stuff is not I understand. where I'm at. Um, the place I always turn to, and I mentioned it somewhere later in the slide deck, oh, is, an, or, is an organization called the SANS Institute, S-A-N-S. -S. SANS Institute, they have a section called the Reading Room huh. that has templates that are really good. Uh, uh, and they have thousands of templates that are really good. Okay, thank you. All right, moving forward. Finally, here it is an hour and a half later. This is just a, an idea to sketch out some potential things that you may or may not be doing at the moment. Uh, are, you, are you on Twitter yet, for example? Do you want to be on Twitter? Um, are you thinking about cloud computing and what does that mean? Are you thinking maybe you will do accounting in the cloud or are you going to be using Peachtree in the office? Are you going to have Office 365 or an exchange service? Just questions. Are you going to be doing these things? Do you allow smartphones? In, uh, to connect to your organization. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Who's maintaining them? What software is <laughs> on them? Do they have an antivirus solution? Um, are you considering remote access? Would you like to allow your employees to work from home or, or coffee shops or someplace else? Do you want to participate in webinars? Do you want to perform webinars? I don't know what you say, but do webinars. Or video conferencing is half your board. Uh, does half your board uh, spend uh, the winter in Arizona? Would they would like to still connect? Do you have the facilities to do this? Right. Is there just some issues that you might be thinking about? About is your organization thinking of developing an app? I think that would be fun. Would it be fun? Would it be fun? So these are the kinds of questions that bug me. Because this first one that happened to me, the one that my executive director out of the blue said, and not, not here at Matt, I should say, um, brought in her brand new iPad and said, it would connect this to the exchange server and make this, make this happen. And I, you know, I had heard of what a 
you know, an iPad was, but I had never considered doing that. And I felt like I was being pressured to make a decision about an appropriate use on the network without being prepared to answer the question. And so here's my Dropbox question. I'm uh, really amazed at the number of organizations I walk into and discover that people's workstations are directly connected to Dropbox um, without having had a discussion. So imagine this, that you have a Dropbox account and you share parts of it with uh, some friend and the friend's computer, ooh, who knew, was uh, infected with a virus and the friend checks out some of your documents and infects the document and your document is automatically synchronized with your workstation at work. Oh, that virus just bypassed your firewall and went straight into the workstation. It's going to be very difficult to know that that happened. Um, but now you have an infection that could spread internally. So think about that. Just think about it. How do you know what's right or reasonable on, uh, in the context of your environment? And what is behind the changes that are being made? That is why you want to have a strategic assessment that leads you to a plan. The catch is you have to keep in mind that this is not truly an IT plan. It's an organizational plan that involves IT. And the other thing that oftentimes folks error on is thinking that it's the IT manager's project. Here, figure that out. But no, does the IT manager really know what every person in your organization does? Do you even have an IT manager? Um, I, I keep thinking back to uh, an experience I had uh, at Darts when I just was walking through the building and I ran across somebody who was drawing out a calendar. So I asked her what she was doing and why, and she said that she works out of the office a lot. She goes and visits clients and was writing out a calendar so that she could share it with her coworkers so that they would know where she was. And I said, did you know that you could do that on Outlook? And no, no one had ever told her anything about calendaring and Outlook. And then I told her that you could share your calendar <laughs> and even have a combined departmental calendar. And this was a major uh, shakeup uh, of this uh, entire department. But nobody was aware of that capability. N your employees may not know that there are better ways of doing things. Your IT director may not know. That's why you've got to have a conversation and involve as many people as possible. And your, I'm finding that your IT director may not, I have the same issue, the open source factor. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of IT people who are terrified of open yeah. source. Yeah. And, yeah. It, you know, it used to be that open source was much less pleasant to deal with yeah. because they, it, it, some some still is not pleasant. It depends on the amount of support that they get, how big, how mature the project is. Um, because what everybody really wants is support in case there's an issue. Right. But a major open source project will have thousands of people and years behind it yeah. and a community that can help. And once you can tap into that community and understand that there are ways of getting help if you run into a problem, then you're good to go. Can I, can I add something? There are, when I see people's plans and I work on tag technology plans, they, there are, are a couple things that almost everyone misses. One is, what is the expectation of the IT staff knowledge? That's never like the plan. And then what's it, it, and what's their training plan as an organization? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think, and then the third thing is, what is is the amount of time that they have to fix something? Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of IT people are scared of open source because if, if something goes down, yeah. it generally takes a little longer to, to, to like re repair something, a major open source piece than it does a major commercial piece. And so that's what they're afraid of. And so if they don't have that time limit mm -hmm. expectation, then I, I, would be, uh, I would be afraid too if, if my 
boss said, I want everything fixed in, in like an hour, no matter what it is, <laughs> then, you know, it's pretty much a commercial product. Yes. You know. Right. And that's the great advantage of commercial product is you're yeah. paying in part for the support. You yeah. can pick up the phone, yeah. be, on, be on hold for 20 minutes yeah. and then talk to somebody who hopefully <laughs> yeah. can solve your problem. Yeah. And so. you can't do that with an open source product. But you can go into forums right. and do research, but like you say, it does take longer. Yeah. So if you've got an IT person who's willing to go after that and you've got, and, and you have an understanding of t reasonable time expectations. Right. You know, the, the, our values are consistent with open source and therefore this is our time frame. And we understand it's gonna take you a little bit longer. Right. It's okay. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, so. That's a really, really good point. Yeah, that's great. So, it, it is the story of the calendar that first made me think. Interview with coworkers. Talk to your colleagues and find out what they're comfortable doing, where their frustra frustrations are, what they would like to be able to do in order to do their job that they're having trouble with. Those are the leading indicators of the kinds of solutions you might want to entertain. And, and really, start with the basics. What is the purpose of your organization? It isn't so that you can retire in five years. It is so that you can serve somebody. You know, focus on your clientele. But, but you can also focus on the back end of your organization to make sure it's as efficient as possible. But the, it's the strategic mission of the organization that's got to be the guiding light. Again, make this a conversation, an agency-wide conversation. Create a tech, this is a, just a suggestion, create a technology oversight committee. Draw from the different aspects of, of your staff, bring them together. Uh, it could be that, uh, you know, it's the, it's the secretarial staff that's been having the biggest problem of all, and it's because they're using Microsoft Office 2003, and it just isn't compatible with what the executive director is handing them every day to, to deal with. It could be something simple, but if you don't have that conversation, you may not be able to help them. Talk to everybody. Um, and of course, once you have the, a, a committee, a group of people, they can work together to make meaningful policies that are that are appropriate to your organization. That is the downfall of um, using templates, uh, is that a, a template is a good guide, but some of its suggestions may be totally inappropriate for your organization. Yeah, and really only from the perspective of a guide as opposed to implementing right. those policies directly into an organization that don't, doesn't fit what you do. Right, right. So exactly. <coughs> And then, of course, ultimately, assuming that you're going to suggest doing something major, like replace your entire system, if you're talking about an investment of $50,000, maybe this shouldn't be one person's decision. Maybe this should be you know, a group decision, or at least when it comes to deciding between solution A and solution B. And solution A and B might not be different systems. It might be different companies you're going to work with. Maybe you're bringing in a consulting company to help implement something. Are you going to go with company A or company B? Again, having a group of people to help make that decision will generally make the decision more satisfactory. If you're small and you don't have a lot of people to work with, consider talking with a similar organization. And similar organization doesn't necessarily mean the same or a similar uh, mission, but might be this, a similar structure, mm -hmm. a small three-person organization. Mm -hmm. Your issues are different than a, how many people work at Darts now? Like a hundred? I'm counting all the drivers for 170. Yeah, 170 versus three. Mm -hmm. Your issues are going to be different and your solutions are going to be different. Mm -hmm. um, even if you were doing the same mission. Uh, and of course, Maybe it is time to bring in a, a outside expertise. Maybe it is time to hire a consultant. A consultant can, especially one who has helped shepherd projects like this uh, in the past, can help you uh, move in the future. Uh, and again, this also, depending upon who you pick as a consultant, 
uh, they may be aware of solutions that, that uh, people in your organization simply haven't considered yet and not aware of. I'm having tech problems. All right. You have, I'm sorry to say you have to keep in mind that while you don't have to have a completely uniform, absolute 100% agreement on things, you do have to have some sort of consensus. And if you don't have executive director buy-in, you're unlikely to have your $50,000 project move forward. Make sure that uh, upper management is completely behind your project, and if they aren't, take the time to work with, with that person or the small group of people to help them understand why it's that important. Um, and we'll return to that at the very end. All right, you have to always keep in mind that what, what your agency does is the deciding factor. And sadly, this is going to take a lot of time. This is going to take a lot of time, a lot more time than you may think. Um, it can take as long as a month just to do a, a serious inventory. And no, that money is going to be involved. Mm -hmm. Even if you go for an open source solution that is completely free, you have to train your staff in how to, how to use that. That's staff time, that's money. All right, uh, any, any assessment is going to turn up some sort of issues. Some of them are pretty darn small. And they're things that need to be attended to, but you don't need the, the monster committee and the outside consultant to help you do that. Oh, you have to update your antivirus. Right. But if they are big projects, then these are just examples. So you're going to replace all your servers with a virtual solution, or you're going to introduce cloud of cloud-based solution. You're going to throw away all your workstations and use iPads. <laughs> then you're it's going to be an investment in money, and it's going to be an investment in time, and you have to also consider training your staff. Now, you can't simply give people stuff and say, here, figure it out, you'll really like it. <laughs> uh, maybe not. So once you have actually determined your plan, you've gotten consensus, you have buy-in, you've developed it, it's time to make a big deal out of it. Reveal it. Do something. Have a celebratory moment. Make the thing work for you. That might be sharing it with a funder. Look, we've just invested six months of work on this project, and we have determined that we need to do this particular thing for these particular reasons, and it's going to cost us this much. How about ponying up some money now? They'll be much more inclined to say yes if you have done that work. Consider designing it to your board. Right. And if nothing else, throw a party. <laughs> it's a great way of getting buy-in from your own staff. And of course, if you don't have buy-in from your staff, this isn't going to work at all. All right, then just some general best practices. Yes, have an annual budget. Know that some things are going to break or become obsolete or disappear and need to be replaced. Plan for that. Ah, yes, the life cycle. Know that whatever device you're using today uh, probably isn't going to be just what you want four years from now. The, uh, that was a, the biggest problem that we had uh, at Darts. We had a huge grant that provided all sorts of fantastic equipment, 10, 12 servers, and software and systems and it was great and then it was five years down the road and no one had ever considered having to replace any of that equipment and suddenly it was all failing at the same time so plan right. um, uh, make sure your like your software is uh, legal everybody gets a legal copy in this day and age when uh, uh, there's TechSoup. Does everyone know about TechSoup? If a Microsoft license is $20, pay the $20. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you have old equipment, don't stockpile it. Get rid of it. Recycle it. You can also repurpose it. 
an old workstation, a five-year-old workstation that I would not want to use as a Microsoft uh, XP computer might be a great firewall mm -hmm. or might be able to run Ubuntu or might be a syslog server. You could do lots of other things with this old, uh, old hardware. That's why my office is full of stuff. <laughs> so the big questions. How can people's jobs be made easier? How can your agency be more effective? Those are the big questions. It's up to you and your team to determine what the answer is. All right. So what, what is my takeaway? Um, burning questions or comments now? I just think you should comment on the fact that Microsoft is ending support for XP next April. Uh, very good point. Yes, and, and that's really just around the corner. And you really, sh if you have any XP machines, you should really seriously consider replacing them for upgrading them. And more likely replacing them. Yes. Um, and speaking of buying a whole bunch of workstations, uh, my first thought would not be to buy workstations. It would be to consider if people should have different devices, uh, probably a laptop, possibly a tablet. Uh, it, it depends. I know lots of people like tablets. I personally, uh, I have several tablets actually, but I, when it comes to writing, I never work on the tablet. I use a workstation. Um, so it does depend on what you're doing with it and what your, your colleagues are doing with them. If I were to buy a bunch of new workstations, and I'm about to buy a bunch of new workstations, I would not buy Windows 8. I would buy Windows 7. Um, Windows 8, to me, is still an experimental uh, operating system, and it's really designed for touchscreen technology. If you're not willing to make the investment in touchscreens, as well as the new hardware and all, all of that, then I would hold off. And it's difficult to know that you can still buy Windows 7, but you can still buy Windows 7. Um, so that's my first thought. If you're going to get a bunch of new things, or different things, try as hard as possible to get the exact same thing, whatever it is. Uh, because you can swap parts, you can troubleshoot uh, one device on another device. There are all sorts of things you can do if you have identical equipment than if you have just randomness. And once I got one <coughs> machine set up and it was easy to clone it to 11 other machines, right. it was just a matter of days to do 11 machines, whereas the first one took about a week to get set up. But once you figure that out, then you can really go. Yes. Um, someone mentioned uh, accepting donations. Uh, I have a long tradition of, of accepting donations. Um, but now I'm very choosy about my donations. I used to take almost anything and then I learned to regret it because I had to recycle most of it. Uh, people were just getting rid of crap and getting a tax benefit from that and then sticking us with a, the issue. Make sure that the quality of the donation is legitimate, that it is something you can really use. I, for example, would not accept a donation of a Windows XP machine, but I would accept a Windows 7 machine, most likely. Um, I have turned to major companies and asked for donations and had terrific success with that. They tend to want to recycle or re refresh their hardware mm -hmm. at a much greater pace than the nonprofit world. And we got, from a simple phone call, 20 workstations that were two years old or three years old, but the best workstations in our organization. The, it was just amazing. And they would have given us more if we had needed more. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. if, if I, I'd start with talking to your board of directors mm -hmm. and see if anybody has any connections with almost any kind of large organization. And then just talk with their IT department. It, it's surprisingly successful. Huh. But get the same thing. Get 10 of whatever it is. Um, since I'm over here this morning, you had mentioned recycling. I'm taking a bunch of stuff that's in the back of my car. PCs for people. Oh yes, that's a great Just organization. Down the road, so it's my dual purpose morning. Very good. But I just kind of have a quick question. We're Mac based. Mm -hmm. Is anybody else in here?
totally use Max. Okay, because sometimes I feel like I'm alone out there. <laughs> Everything is PC based, you know, and I struggle sometimes to. No, actually, more and more. More and more, more but I mean, it's thanks to tablets yeah. and whatnot. People are starting. Okay, I just kind of wanted to know if I was as lonely as I thought. And I, I was. picked up a commonality, which so, so you're doing this database um, workshop in November, but frankly, I, we can't wait until then. And, and so I'm wondering if, and we should, yeah. I think you should. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, here at, uh, at MAP, we use Salesforce as our uh, most important database, and I go to uh, user group meetings. When I'm at those meetings, there are only there are three kinds of devices there: iPhones, MacBooks, and uh, iPads. Nobody, I'm sorry, nobody brings <laughs> a, a Windows device. Uh, I, fi I find that extraordinary. It's just amazing to me. Uh, at home, I have. Well, I now have, I have I have everything. Sorry, you probably do too. But um, I I'm a big fan of Macs. They're they're self healing. They're straightforward. They don't have anywhere near the bugs that uh, Windows products well, on do. On the other hand, now that Apple is becoming the corporate behemoth, I'm actually consider. I mean, my next product might not be. Um, yeah. But. My, my most recent product wasn't a Mac and wasn't a, a Windows, it was an Android tablet. So they, yeah. Even if you have a Mac though, put an antivirus solution yeah. on it, please. Yeah. There are free, good antivirus solutions for Macs. Sorry, I'm sticking with Other questions? I, I sense questions. Sure. This one in the Actually, I have, one is a comment, one is a question. Um, what helped me when I was initially assigned the, first I, w I was assigned the databases and then I was assigned the IT. So <coughs> I'm wearing three hats, resource development, IT, and MIS. Uh, but I do have staff underneath me. I think what helped me was um, I began subscribing to online. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is Tech Republic. And they've got lots of stuff. You know, they, you can uh, um, get automatic feeds and they will send it to your inbox directly. And so it has helped me to keep pace with technology, like issues with this different stuff, mm -hmm. and then in, within Tech Republic alone, you can start choosing which websites to also uh, subscribe to because there are websites which just, uh, which are specific to security, mm -hmm. and there are websites which are specific to software. Mm -hmm. So, and then you know, and sometimes that's how I found out about SAS Institute because that's where they pointed me to when I started researching about policy. And then my other thing there is a now this is a question. When you do, uh, based on your presentation, it seems that the technology assessment is really an in-depth process. How long does this process normally take? Uh, it, de it depends on um, how many people are involved and the size of the organization. So you can sort of guess yeah. based on if you're a three-person versus a ten-person versus a twenty-person. We're versus similar a 40 to person. guard, yeah. right? Um, but it's it's. <coughs> It's always going to take something, you know, at least I would say ten hours just to, to understand uh, your current situation and get a sense of your work processes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're a larger organization, it's going to take significantly more. Uh, in part because you have more equipment, but in part because you're also doing more things and have more processes. It can be if you're a, a hundred and seventy person organization, you have. Uh, internal um, a, a multitude of databases, you have a financial system, you have uh, onboard computing on the buses, you have all sorts of things. If you're a small organization, you know, you have three systems that are yeah. mostly in the cloud, and, and so it's, yeah, it's easier. But I would say um, 10 to 40 hours, depending upon the scope. And you can do this process for something more targeted, uh, rather than Taking yeah. in, you know, your entire organization and uh, your entire uh, uh, infrastructure, you could say, let's just focus on our database issue, or let's just focus on, um, I don't know, some other particular uh, re a remote. We need a different way to work. Uh, you know, whether it's going to be a remote access or uh, tablets or something like that, and have a reduced focus. Can I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I know a lot of very large technical companies like the IBM, the 
McKinsey's do to like provide their client stuff, which I think is is like a really good idea. They do a plan that's between five and ten pages long, and then they go back to the to like the client and say, "What is it you want more depth in?" And then it can be up to a thousand pages after that, you know, because I I think uh, especially with a lot of nonprofits, there are some things that people like. There are some people that want to know what software is on every single machine versus other people just want to know what machine is running. <laughs> so you have to figure out what knowledge and what's the depth that you want to have and that determines the length, the depth, and, and, and really how long it takes. Basically, we, our challenge there is we have seven off-site locations, yeah. we have five databases, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then we have basically um, 80 computer workstations, excluding our, we have I think three or four computer labs. So all in all, the, yeah, so it's, it's and I just have one IT person. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and I'm now being asked to come up with a technology plan, you know, which is going to be presented by the board, and mm -hmm. I'm, I mean a panic mode. So and it's it's like you know um, what has happened in the past was that everything was just patched up. Yes. You know. So um, when my new IT person came in, it was just like, okay, where do these uh, cables run? From which end to which end? So now it's like we're now putting that into place. So um, if I do a bare bones strategic plan, where should I start? Oh my God, that is the big question, isn't it? Do you have an inventory of everything? We are. We have already started doing an inventory of our. Um, we started first with our hardware, and then we're now moving to a software um, audit. Mm -hmm. You know, auditing every piece mm -hmm. of software installed in mm -hmm. every machine, and then um, we are now moving towards. Uh, how should I say that? In uh, doing also an inventory on our offsite locations. Mm -hmm. But the reality there is that we're also responding to IT tickets. Sure. We're also responding to major IT projects yeah, coming along our way. You know, we, we are migrating to, uh, how should I say that? Um, we're exploring uh, human resources database. We're exploring a uh, uh, new health and fitness club uh, software, club management software. So these are all major projects that's, that's hitting us along the way. So it's, it's like, you know, we're straddling Yes. So many yeah. stuff at once. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. sounds like the first step in your strategic plan is to ask for permission to do your strategic plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, literally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is the time to consider bringing in a consultant. Yeah. Um, we have some tools that can be helpful. We have one tool that helps assess um, how um, staff are using technology and we can find areas of improvement. Uh -huh. But we also have a lengthy questionnaire that that covers most of the major systems that an organization would have, and that can help also pinpoint kinds of uh, directions you might want to go in. And this isn't unique to MAP, I'm sure other, mm -hmm. other consulting services can do this as well. But to find, right, like you say, the, the blow away the, the depth, the dust and all that stuff, to be able to focus on a few key areas that will <coughs> greatly impact your organization. You have your challenges. Yeah. I know. Right, and I would I would just really emphasize what Roger said about figuring out how are people using the applications mm -hmm. and where are the gaps between what they're using and what they need to accomplish the mission, because that'll really help you sort out. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it, it sounds to me like your biggest challenge is going to be prioritizing mm -hmm. and figuring out, you know, you have a finite amount of resources, mm -hmm. um, so then how do you best leverage the staff time and the money that you have available to you? Um, and, you know, what kind of investments are going to have the most impact? How do you even evaluate return on investment for some of those things? Mm -hmm. um, so that that's going to be the hard thing. And then also, you know, maybe you can identify something that has potential to have a humongous impact on your organization's mission, on, um, you know, maybe it's staff productivity or, you know, some kind of back office, like security, efficiency, whatever, but maybe it's also something that will really impact the quality of life for the people you're serving or help you expand your services dramatically. Um, so then, like, how do you, how do you articulate that in a way that you can then go to a funder? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what kind of plan are they going to want to see? to show that you've thought through this, that you can really make a case for this investment, and that you are equipped to really carry it out once you receive that funding, 
that you can demonstrate to them, like, okay, we're prepared to really take this and invest it wisely and manage that. Yeah, thank you for your Can I make one other suggestion? Mm -hmm. And I know this is a hard one to do, but I think it might be important from where I'm hearing you talk. I would stop everything. I would not create anything new. I would not do anything new until you had a plan in place. And I would tell yeah, people, sorry. I'm going to take, you know, whatever, three month time out, no changes to anything. For like three months, we're, we're all we're going to do is work on this plan. Doing the big picture. Yes. So that yeah. you, you don't spend three months patching systems, systems that, that you then replace. replace. Yeah. yeah. And it's mm -hmm. hard because we just, you know, I came into a situation where they were full bore about to move into Nation Builder without having evaluated any other options. And I'm like, you know, it, Nation Builder may be the right choice for us. I don't know. But we, but we got we to gotta check. You know, because and they were it, it, because once you get on, it's like well, it's it's inexpensive. The startup costs are low. It's a monthly fee. Yeah, but then you're you're down that path. And That's so right. It's the free taste you, of you, heroin. You make us yeah. You make a small choice and you think it'll be okay, and then you find yourself five years later yeah. dealing with yeah, you know. So. And to my mind, any new system has got to be able to talk to other systems, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. whatever it is. However you've got to make that work, make sure that you don't have silo data that is not usable. Oh, I just have